Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this panel discussion, Paving the Way for a Green Society, Upskilling the Workforce. Achieving net zero and other climate ambitions will require a green transition in which we will need to rethink the way we design, market and distribute goods and services across all sectors of the economy. A successful green transition will need to be underpinned by a workforce equipped with low carbon and sustainability skills and knowledge. Environmental professionals will be integral to this. As we begin this transition, the environmental sector will become more closely integrated with all other sectors and industries. How an environmental professional is defined is likely to evolve and expand, and environmental scientists will be working with an even more diverse range of organisations and people. Upskilling and reskilling of the work workforce will therefore be vital to meeting climate and net zero ambitions. Today, we are delighted to be joined by three expert panellists and two students who will be exploring the topics of skills from three different perspectives. We will hear from all of the speakers first, and we will then have time for questions and discussion after their presentations. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box at any point during the presentations, and I will then ask these on your behalf during the Q&A session. Please do also make sure that you put the person's name in if you're directing a question to a specific panelist. Alternatively, you can raise your hand during the session and we'll try to get to you so that you can ask your question in person. And just so you all know, this event has been recorded and will be made available on the IES YouTube channel. Without further ado, I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker, Paul Gosling. Paul is Managing Director and Founder of Porter Gosling Limited in Environment and Sustainability Recruitment. Paul is a specialist recruiter and headhunter in the environment and sustainability sector with over 25 years experience and he will be exploring whether the environmental workforce is equipped for a green transition through recruiter insights on trends and skills for green jobs. Thanks very much, Paul. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ethne, and, and thank you very much for the invitation. If, if I give you a nod when, uh, when to go through. So if you go to the next day, next, um, the next um, slide, thank you. That's just a little bit about myself. Um, so I've, I've got an environmental science degree myself, uh, graduated in late 80s, early 90s, and I've worked in environmental recruitment since 95. So I've, I've worked with uh, thousands of, of people and, and hundreds of, of, of companies and seen some really significant changes that have gone on in that time. So there's a lot of, of uh, changes that are happening and will continue happening. And that makes it one of the most fascinating areas to be involved with. My current business is Porter Gosling. Uh, which was established in 2016 specifically to the environment and sustainability sector. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Let me just try and. Super. So, the green transition, some backgrounds to that. Um, so, it's a broad phrase, as, as Anthony's already mentioned, that there's a lot of different elements to it. Um, but uh, what I'll be focusing on are the comments relating to uh, the, the roles relevant to IES. So specifically those environmental consultant roles, um, broad range of topics included in that, corporate sustainability, environmental management, and then increasing ESG managers, which is one of the big um, growth areas, as well as uh, the building side of things. So building engineers, energy managers and the like, renewable specialists, waste management, circular economy, all things that will be very familiar to you all, I'm sure. Before I delve into that, uh, thank, thanks, Ethan. If you go on to the next slide, um, I've identified a number of drivers for change, which you'll you'll see there. So, so I started with with the sort of big topic uh, and climate change and its impact on both people and economies. And I think the difference between the two is quite significant, uh, as well as the environmental impact. There are going to be significant uh, challenges to to people and economies as well. I think one of the things that's changed recently and, and is increasing is that engagement from the finance sector in sustainability issues, largely led by sort of the, the implications of the risk to their investments of climate change and other areas. But increasingly, it's a, it's a broader scale involvement in that area, which is very welcome and, and definitely one of the themes that we'll, we'll pick up on throughout this. There's, there's a significant public concern, and I think that has come from an increased scrutiny of, of what corporate uh, organisations are actually doing on the ground. Uh, some significant issues over air quality and uh, the, the legal issues that, that various uh, local councils are facing in terms of protecting their, their um, residents from, from the problems of air quality. I think the other thing that's changing is that understanding of the global scale of what we're doing. 
uh, th that it's increasingly obvious that what we're doing in the UK and, and in individual countries is also affecting uh, the, the global environment. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals have been a really useful focus around which to bring all of these things. And I think that has significantly taken the agenda on and, and a lot of organizations are using those as their, their starting point um, to structure the discussions around sustainability. And if anybody hasn't seen those and looked at those, then they're very well worthwhile doing so. Particularly what's notable there is, is the social issues as part of that sustainability agenda. And again, that's a trend that, that I've seen and an opportunity that I've seen, which is that increasing use of social issues as part of that sustainability agenda. And then a, a theme that I'll keep coming back to is, is the power of big data in various ways for good and ill. The power of big data is very significant. So that, that's looked at what's behind those. So, so we'll look now at maybe some of the skills that are in demand. Uh, and I've split this into technical and then non-technical skills. From a technical uh, side of things, it's definitely a positive sign at the moment. Uh, there's a shortage of well-qualified and experienced people across a very wide range of areas. Most of those, uh, that, that uh, drought of, of people, that talent is, is at, at the more experienced level, to be honest, uh, as a result of lack of training, lack of people coming into the market, but also an unwillingness to, uh, to move jobs uh, right now. So there's a definite shortage of, of, of talent at the at those sort of levels, but that's feeding through to more junior recruitment and the graduate levels as well, where companies are recognizing uh, the, the fact that there is an issue there and looking to grow their own on a, on a much more regular basis. And they're also feeding through into rising salaries. It, it's traditionally been a sector which people come into for the love of it, rather than because they're going to make their, their millions. Uh, and that, while that is still the, tr the case, I'm afraid, um, but salaries are definitely on the rise and companies are working hard to keep people. It's a, a very positive view from that point. I've identified there for you a few of the specific areas that are, are busy at the moment and, and the technical areas associated with developments um, at EIA process. So ecologists, air quality specialists, environmental noise, acoustics, uh, the flood risk, uh, drainage management, all of those are very, very significant uh, areas of, of growth in terms of opportunities. Brownfield redevelopment is, is, has been uh, a significant area. It's slowed a little bit in recent years, but there's a very big drive now to, to put a little bit of a fire under the uh, housing side of things. So brownfields are, are going to be identified and redeveloped at an increasing rate. And the skills associated that with that are going to be uh, very important as well. I mentioned before uh, the sort of the building side of things, uh, the built environments uh, and energy management in particular, again associated with the climate change agenda and carbon uh, carbon management. That's a very significant area of, of growth. And then a couple of areas that I've, I've previously touched on: uh, social impact and environment, social governance. ESG is a phrase that you'll see banded around a great deal. And it's very much a growing area. Uh, last thing I've mentioned there as a technical skill is project management. Uh, it's not just the, the individual technical skills, but it's the, bring, the ability to bring things together and manage projects effectively. And I think that's one area that, that individuals at all levels of their career can build and grow and develop if they want to be more multidisciplinary and, and, and effective in their roles. Thank you, Ethne. Uh, talking about the skills in demand, the, the, the non-technical side are equally important. And I've, I've touched already on the digital side of things. So data management, uh, use of AI for all sorts of, uh, of, of uses. Blockchain is being used increasingly to assess situations. And one of the effects of COVID is, is that a lot of the remote, uh, a lot of the, the site surveys have, have been done remotely. So there's an opportunity to look at the digital skills and, and how to manipulate data within that context. Um, second thing I've put down there is, is the understanding of the, the business drivers. It's all very well being a passionate environmentalist and uh, looking to change the world. Uh, and the, but in many ways, the, the, the most effective way of doing that is to understand how to engage with the business community, uh, where the commercial elements of decisions are being made, and to understand and learn how to engage with that. To do that, the, the next point on my, uh, my list were, was communication skills and being able to communicate not just within the echo chamber of like-minded people, 
but being able to reach outside that to a more skeptical audience to understand why there's that skepticism, what the issues that they're facing are, and, and to put the arguments across that, that mean you're able to, to move forward with your, uh, you, what are very well-meaning ideas. Um, part of that is, is the ability to get on with people, build relationships, whatever role you're doing, uh, the ability to bring people with you and to engage with them on a number of levels is, is very much a, a key part of, of what will make you a success in, in any career that you take on. Next thing there that I've put down is problem solving, and, and I'd probably include creativity in that as well. Uh, maybe an underutilized skill, particularly within the scientific community, is that ability to think creatively about situations and problems. And again, I, th I think that's something that can be learned. It comes more naturally, as, as many things do, to different types of people. But there's a very good opportunity to learn how to be creative with your thinking and problem solving to drive matters forward. And one of the key elements of that is to have a positive mindset. If you're positive about what you're doing and, and you approach things with a, an optimistic outlook, then in my view, there's not a lot that can't be achieved uh, with, with good, uh, clear thinking. And the last thing I've, I've put down there is in terms of the multidisciplinary nature of what we're doing in. We're dealing with some of the most complex issues around and, and the ability to see that from many different areas and, and cross sectors is a key part of being successful. So that, that's a sort of summary of, of some of the key skills that, that are, are required. Um, let, let's think about the future trends. Uh, and I've touched already on, on some of these, but I wanted to just highlight a, a few of them in a bit more detail. Um, the, the sort of tech giants are starting to understand what the issues are around the environmental and sustainability side of things. And, and when they start to roll, there'll be some really significant changes coming. And I don't think we've seen them yet, but they're around the corner without a doubt. And that will be focused around that digital economy and the utilization of big data to identify and solve some of the issues, both big and small, that we're seeing at the moment. I, I've put as my next point that the climate change, it, it's, it is without doubt one of the drivers of, of a lot of the interest in sustainability and environmental issues. When I was doing my degree back in the, the 80s, it was very much about pollution management. Uh, acid rain was, was the big story. Uh, and pollution management was was core to the environmental cause. Now we, we've sort of moved on a little bit from that towards a bigger, broader climate change agenda. Uh, pollution, as mentioned previously, is still a critical part of that. But there's a as a wider piece of work that, that encompass encompassed in many ways by the climate change agenda. And then you can pick out individual uh, specific areas of, of plastics and the circular economy that are coming in and, and raise the heads when, when certain uh, issues are, are coming to the fore. Um, next thing on my, on my list was water scarcity and, and the sort of associated issue of sustainable food production. Uh, it's an issue that's been around for a very long time is the number of people that we've got to cope with in, on the planet. Um, the issues around water scarcity are more significant in some parts of the, country, of the world uh, and even the country uh, than, than others and they will only increase as, as we move forward. And alongside that, the sustainable food production is going to be important to make sure we're, we're delivering those, those changes. Uh, there's, there's a lot of talk at the moment about uh, vegetarianism as, as a sustainability agenda. Uh, that was a very small part of, of what we were talking about 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, it's a very much more a growing movement is, is that one of the ways of, of impacting your carbon footprint is the vegetarian and, and eating less meat. And that's a significant trend that I think will continue. Next on my list was, was the changing infrastructure requirements. And I'm thinking particularly of mobility, uh, electric vehicles, self-drive technology will make significant changes and, and bring different ways of, of doing things across all our lives. Uh, but more broadly, the infrastructure that we have now is, is one that will evolve and develop. And, and looking forward and, and, and seeing that for the future requirements as well as the current is going to be an interesting challenge. A lot of investment is going to be required for that. And always where there are investment, there are career opportunities and, and a chance to make those, uh, those investments as green and sustainable as they possibly can be. 
And on a similar vein, the, the, the built and urban environments is, is the next thing I've identified. Uh, housing and, and uh, buildings more generally are, are one of the big uh, consumers and, uh, of, of, of energy and of materials. And that's going to be a significant element to make sure that whatever we're doing forward to, to house the people and give them places to work and leisure activities are going to be important going forward as well. On a more broad geopolitical stance, there's, a, there's definitely been a move to a more nationalistic viewpoint. Um, I think that was exacerbated and, uh, and maybe accelerated by the COVID pandemic where borders were closed, uh, but actually it was happening uh, in a broader scale before that as well. And I think there's a challenge that we as environmental people who recognize the global nature of the challenges that are faced by the planet, to make sure that, that the issues aren't boiled down to who's doing best to a series of league tables or nationalistic self-interest uh, overriding uh, the, the, the global challenges that, that we have. So I think that's an important thing for people coming in and, and working in this, in this uh, sector to be aware, aware of. On a more positive note, though, um, it's, it's very much the case that the corporate world is getting on board. ESG, I've mentioned in relation to the finance space, but more broadly, uh, the CEO activists, organisations that have uh, sustainability at their core and as a, a core part of what they do are really taking flight, I think. And, and that's a very positive trend. Uh, and again, there's, there's a lot to be said that uh, if you really want to make a difference, uh, don't, don't be an environmentalist, go and study an MBA and, and, and lead the next uh, Google into a more sustainable la uh, line of work. So uh, there's, there's a lot of, to be said about taking uh, an interest in environmental issues and using it more broadly. And I'll maybe come on to that a little bit later. Um, coming back to the main point, though, I thought it'd be useful just to give you an idea about some of the things that, that uh, you can do to future proof uh, those skills. Um, Central to what we do as, as environmentalists is very much the technical understanding and the ability to grasp complex technical issues, and, and that's not going to change. So making sure those technical skills are there in the first place is, is a really key and important part of that process. Alongside that, the, the non-technical skills that I've talked about uh, are going to be core to your effectiveness. So it's all very well understanding uh, the technical side, but, but being aware of the, uh, where they fit in and, and explaining those to a wider audience is going to be central to, to how effective you can be in that process. The next thing I've, I've mentioned is, is being comfortable with change. The, the pace of change is increasing all the time and, and will only continue to do so. Uh, whatever you do, it, it comes into that creativity, that positive mindset, see, see change as an opportunity. Uh, look for the potential within the changes that are going on to make a difference. And, and if you can get comfortable with that sort of change, then you've got an opportunity to really make a difference. Uh, always be learning. Um, I, I think that's, that's a, an obvious factor, but whether that be into the project management side of things, developing your communication skills, uh, I've, I've identified a few other things that, that might be useful to look at as well. So we can look at the sales side of things. Sales is an odd business, which one, men, not many of you will, will want to go into directly, but the ability to sell a concept, sell what you're thinking about uh, is, is a very important one when it comes to driving through change. Uh, your ability to write, copywriting, writing reports, writing persuasive arguments is an important element of, of any role. Um, as is that computer programming. Again, I'll come on to that in a minute. But the, the point there is, is that it's all very well having the technical skills, but you've got to develop other, other facets to your capabilities on top of that to be really effective. Um, again, associated with the programming side, it's developing that digital data management um, skill set. That's whether it be uh, manipulating Excel spreadsheets, but I think that's increasingly uh, going to be supplanted by more specialist uh, software systems and being able to use those, manipulate them, uh, change them and, and, and work alongside them, I think is a very important skill set that, that's very valuable for everybody to, to deliver on. The last thing I've, I've, I've put there, and I'm coming towards the end, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, the last thing I've put there is, is that the best environmentalists I know are, are well-rounded people. 
Uh, so this is not just about reading uh, worthy texts. This is about creating a, a good environment for yourself. It's about being well-rounded. It's about appreciating the world around you and being involved and engaged and, and, and making sure that you're taking joy from what's around you and interest in what's around you. In, in my view, people who are have that that sense of the wider context within which we are working and which with, within which things are happening are, are some of the most effective in relation to uh, their environmental capabilities as well. So just to, to summarize, um, it, it's very much an exciting time to be involved in, in this sector. The environmental and sustainability sector is, has grown exponentially already. It will continue to do so. Um, and that means that there are some fantastic opportunities for really fascinating careers in the, in the market and in the sector. And that, that's across a very broad range of areas. It doesn't necessarily need to be the traditional route. So I think there's also that opportunity to redefine what a green job is and, and what it can be. I think there's a there's a, a potential there for you to look in a in a wider context about how you can take an interest and an expertise in the environmental and sustainability issues and and work out how best to deliver on that and it's a it's a very exciting time uh, to be able to do that as things move forward and develop. So that's my uh, that's my. Um, my presentation. I, I believe, Ethne, we're, we're having questions at the end, so I'm very happy to, to, to uh, hear what those are later. And, and Ethne, you did a fantastic job there. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, and thank you, Paul. That was a really interesting presentation. It's really useful to hear about the, the various technical and non-technical skills that are going to be needed. Um, and I think your point about getting, getting comfortable with change is a really poignant one in the face of the transformative change that's going to be needed to meet some of these net zero and climate ambitions. So thank you very much. You're welcome, thank um, you. Thank you. As Paul said, we will do questions at the end, um, so, but please do continue adding them in the Q&A section. I can see that people already are. Um, and if you are addressing it to a certain person, please include their name. Perfect. Um, so we'll move on to our next speakers. Um, so I'd now like to introduce our second presentation, and this will feature Liz Price, Professor of Environmental Education an academic institutional lead for the environment at Manchester Metropolitan University. She is Associate Head of School of the European School of Sustainability, Science and Research, Chair of the Committee of Heads of Environmental Sciences, Council Member of the IES, and a member of the QAA and Advanced HE Advisory Group. She is joined by Chris Kitching and Ellie Cook, both of whom are second year students at Manchester Metropolitan Univers University and are responsible future student sustainability ambassadors. Liz, Chris and Ellie will be talking about the integration of net zero and sustainability skills in the curriculum. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Ethne, and, and hello, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen, if that's OK, if you just bear with me for one moment. And hopefully uh, you can see that all right, Ethne. Does that come up yes, OK? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. I'm just waiting for my little... Uh, a little arrows to appear on my screen. There we are. OK, thank you very much, everybody. And, and thank you for your invitation to present at this meeting. So for facing forward with sustainability skills, what Ellie, Chris and I hope to do today is to share some thoughts on what education for sustainable development for all means to us at Manchester Met and to encourage you to be ambitious in driving this agenda forward, whatever your sphere of influence. And judging by the audience on the call, colleagues are already doing this, so we hope today will empower you to continue. In terms then of um, the previous speaker, it's really clear that it's a priority to embed sustainability and net zero delivery across the whole education system um, and in lifelong learning and to encourage the uptake of soft and cross-sectoral skills in education and business settings alike. And we have structured our sort of thoughts for our presentation around the three key themes linked to this and aligning to sustainability for all. And these are principles, progress and partnership. So firstly, in terms of principles, we'd like to touch on three aspects that we found helpful in shaping what we do at Manchester Met. The first of these is sustainable futures. 
the second is Education for Sustainable Development or ESD and the third is ESD for All. And for the first aspect, what we mean by sustainable futures is that we have a responsibility to increase the pace of action to deliver the UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs as our previous speaker outlined and Net Zero by driving forward changes that will equip students to be resilient, adaptable, skilled and knowledgeable and can give them agency to drive a better future. And the second aspect of this really focuses on education for sustainable development or ESD, which has been defined in many ways, but a recent framing by UNESCO captures many aspects. And I'd just like to pause on that so everybody's comfortable with what we're talking about. So by ESD, we mean ESD empowers learners to take informed decisions and responsible actions for environmental integrity, economic viability and a just society for present and future generations while respecting cultural diversity. It is about lifelong learning and it is an integral part of quality education. ESD is holistic and transformational education, which addresses learning content and outcomes, pedagogy and the learning environment. It achieves its purpose by transforming society. And the third aspect that we're passionate about at Manchester Met is ESD for all, because in our view, all educators have a responsibility to consider how they facilitate the graduation of responsible citizens with a sense of purpose who can think critically and compassionately within current and future contexts to influence change and make a difference in their community. And ESD can be considered as a lens through which all academic disciplines and all roles can be viewed. And increasingly, ESD has become one of the expectations of current and prospective higher education students. And as just outlined, beyond the academic community, sustainability capability aligns with priority skills demanded by employers. And in recognition that a more urgent and meaningful response is needed to deliver the SDGs, UK ESD guidance drawing on UNESCO key competencies for sustainability has been comprehensively revised to support universities to deliver education which enables students to acquire sustainability competencies, equipping them to play leadership roles in an increasingly uncertain world, whichever career or life path they take. And there is growing recognition of the value of education for sustainable development for all learners and of the unique role universities play in the transformation of individuals, institutions and societies towards more sustainable futures. But despite this enhanced recognition of the importance of ESD in universities and increased engagement, research suggests that ESD remains a largely niche activity. And this is really because the expansion of ESD in universities can represent a challenging aspect of the sustainability agenda, since it requires deep reflection on the suitability of traditional approaches of governance and leadership, learning and teaching, disciplinary structures and measurements of success. But these challenges are acknowledged and addressed by the new ESD guidance. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that, I recommend uh, you do because it's relevant to all sectors. Partnership obviously is also an important enabler for ESD and net zero skills development and provides the opportunity to harness the willingness of broader communities to help transform learning. And what we'd like to focus on today in our conversation is our partnerships aligned to net zero Northwest skills, circular economy, nature-based solutions, carbon literacy and responsible futures to outline how these are embedding sustainability and net zero delivery and shaping the workforce of the future through the work we're doing at Manchester Met. So further education and higher education institutions must play a leading role in developing local skills for green jobs through collaboration with business. And Manchester Met is developing and leading a technical skills group for Net Zero Northwest, which is an industry led cluster through which Northwest universities, the FE sector, industry and local government, such as GMCA or Greater Manchester Combined Authority and MCC, which is Manchester City Council, as, as indicated on the slide here, amongst others, will come together to develop a pipeline of new or transferable skills for a green economy. For example, working closely with our Manchester Hydrogen Fuel Cell Innovation uh, Centre and all the work that that team does. 
At Manchester Met, we're also well placed with our multidisciplinary research and industry collaborations to focus on new ways to tackle the challenge of transitioning to a circular economy. And we're engaged in cross-sector projects and skills development, including the Transform CE project that we've highlighted here, which will turn plastic waste into valuable 3D printing feedstock. And Manchester Met is also working with local, regional and international partners to restore carbon storage capacity of peatland, including creating a carbon farm by establishing sphagnum moss on former drained agricultural land for replication across northwest Europe. And what's really important for us is getting our students involved and the carbon literacy project training program, which I'm going to focus on next, develops skills and knowledge for climate action and carbon reduction and has been recognised by the UN as one of the 100 worldwide transformative action programmes. And working in partnership with the Carbon Literacy Project, Manchester Met has delivered carbon literacy to our students since 2012. And our innovative peer-to-peer -peer carbon literacy for staff and students training model is available to all our students and staff. In 2020, the Manchester Met programme was shared by the Carbon Literacy Project with all UK universities for free as part of their UK government funded public sector carbon literacy toolkit to maximise the speed and ease with which carbon literacy can be adopted. But most crucially at Manchester Met, we aim to make sustainability central to student experience through the curriculum, through extracurricular activities such as our RISE programme, which boosts skills, confidence um, and attributes for the future, and also paid roles. And one example of this is our Sustainability Ambassador Scheme. Our student sustainability ambassadors engage in a number of initiatives across the university, including Responsible Futures. Responsible Futures is an accreditation scheme which helps students to gain the skills and experience they need to thrive as global citizens. And saving the best till last, I've pleasure now in introducing you to Ellie and Chris, who are sustainability ambassadors, playing a key role in our Responsible Futures activities as student representatives on the Responsible Futures Working Group. They will outline the benefits of this scheme for boosting skills. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Liz. So I'll be going through motivation, opportunities and skills. So I'd say my main motivation was to be working on and within sustainability outside of my environmental science degree in a practical and interdisciplinary way. I also want to develop my CV with substantial and interesting work. And finally, making a difference and working towards better things for people and planet at Manchester Met and hopefully beyond. Opportunities. So this role has allowed me to understand more about my career path, interests, and has inspired me to continue to work towards a career that involves many aspects of what I'm working on now. I have managed to network with professionals, develop my working practices, push myself, and of course, present and take part in events such as this one. Working with like-minded people has also given me a small community and supportive professional working environment whilst at university, for which I feel very lucky. And finally, skills. So taking inspiration from the UNESCO key competencies for sustainability, I've developed my systems thinking ability in a practical space, having worked with a varied team that spans across the university and the students' union. Collaboration too is a key skill I've made progress on, which will give me a strong foundation when in a job. Lastly, I hope to continue my learning of effective critical thinking which is a skill I feel is vitally important in this space as it allows us to question the norms and imagine a new path whilst also remaining effective. Thank you, Chris. Over to you, Ellie. Okay, perfect. So my motivation for this role came from my interest in sustainability. I really wanted to develop my knowledge whilst working towards creating a more sustainable life for myself and for my community. I've also never really worked in this sector before, so I was really interested in the sustainability skills and behaviours that I would develop. Um, regarding opportunities, this role has provided me with many different opportunities, from working with a close and supportive group to presenting at student-led events. These are all things that I had not experienced before in previous jobs, which was really refreshing. Furthermore, the opportunity to work independently, knowing that we had trust from our team was really great. And finally, with skills, I have learned some really valuable skills with this job. 
whilst working as a sustainability ambassador, such as self-confidence in my own decisions, better organisation and obtaining my carbon literacy certificate. In relation to the UNESCO competencies, I have developed my collaboration competency as I've really enjoyed working in a team and I've learned so much from them. Thank you, Ellie. So just to conclude, we hope we've shared a bit of our vision that's for integrating education, research and partnership to embed sustainability and net zero skills and that you're encouraged to drive this agenda forward, whatever your sphere of influence. Thank you for listening and we'd be happy to take questions or comments at, at the end of the session. So thank you very much. Thank you, Liz, Ellie and Chris. That was really interesting. Uh, really great to hear about the different partnerships that Manchester Met has going on to embed these sustainability and net zero skills. And Chris and Ellie, great to hear about your um, ambassador role and what's that, what that's added in terms of your own skills as well. So thank you very much for presenting. Um, and yes, please everyone put questions in the uh, Q&A box and we can come back to these at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Great, um, so we'll move on to our last speaker of the day. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Nick Mollo, Executive Director of the Aldersgate Group, a cross economy organization. The work of the group focuses on developing policy positions to tackle major environmental challenges in a way that is environmentally effective and can deliver economic benefits. Nick will be talking about the need for a comprehensive low carbon skill strategy. Thank you so much for joining us, Nick. My pleasure and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, really interesting to, to hear what uh, Manchester Metropolitan are, are up to. So uh, as Afni said, um, uh, Aldersgate Group, uh, we have around 60 member organisations who come from a wide range of different economic sectors. And we are all about looking at how you can tackle major environmental challenges uh, credibly, but in a way that can also deliver economic benefits in terms of innovation, in terms of investment in innovation, in new markets or low carbon goods and services, growing supply chains, and critically investment in skills. And um, what I was asked to talk today is to give you a bit of a sense of why we feel that the UK needs a comprehensive low carbon skills strategy and what should be the key pillars of that strategy. Um, before I do that, though, I thought it'd be worth just taking a step back and reflecting on the huge um, transformational change that lies uh, ahead of us. Um, there's clearly a, a lot of uh, transformation at play here. We, we, of course, have the UK's net zero emissions target. Now, to, to I think, appreciate the scale of change uh, that this target presents, it's worth looking back at the Committee on Climate Change report uh, on the Sixth Carbon Budget, which, which came out in December, and which made the point that by 2030, we will need to spend every year an additional £50 billion in infrastructure to put ourselves on track for our 2035 targets, by which time we need to cut emissions by 78%, and then on a path to net zero emissions by, by, uh, by 2050. So that's an extra £50 billion every year on top of what we're already spending. So it's a huge infrastructure uh, project. Um, but clearly we have other major connected uh, transformations and transitions that are happening at the same time. Uh, later this year, the Environment Bill will receive royal assent and that will set long-term legally binding targets to reverse the decline in the natural environment uh, with uh, targets around air quality, biodiversity, um, water quality and so on. And we also have um, a big transformation happening in the waste sector where increasingly the waste sector isn't a waste sector, it's actually a resources sector and the focus is moving toward how can you move away from a world of waste towards a world where a world where you reuse resources so huge change of foot and it's clearly a huge job creation potential in that transition um just a few months ago uh, national grid published a report around the job creation potential of the net zero transition in the energy sector and they made the point that uh, over the next uh, three decades, some 400,000 jobs would have to be created in the energy sector to put the sector on track for zero emissions. And 260,000 of those jobs uh, would be new jobs. So uh, huge uh, skill investment requires. And even if you, if you were to, to put the net zero uh, transition aside for a moment, we already feel uh, or face uh, a, a skills challenge. Um, a couple of years ago, the Department of Education published a survey which showed that 67% uh, of hard to fill vacancies tended to not be filled because of a lack of skills. Um, and a study from the Open University a couple of weeks, a couple of years ago, uh, sorry, found that around 91% of businesses uh, said that they were facing a degree of skill shortages. So 
we clearly need a, a comprehensive uh, strategy to ensure that our current but also our future workforce have the skills they need to benefit from the job uh, creation potential of the net zero transition. And from our perspective, this requires three key pillars. Uh, the, the first one actually really touches on what Manchester Metropolitan were, were talking about just now, which is really around the need of embedding environmental sustainability across the education system. And now clearly that's a huge task at hand, but I think it's absolutely vital that those students coming out of the world of education understand that they live in a world which is carbon constrained, which is resource constrained, and that all of their ideas and their innovation need to work within those constraints. I think that's absolutely essential. And in concrete terms, I think this will require embedding climate change and environmental sustainability across all levels of the national curriculum from primary education straight through to uh, apprenticeship uh, standards. Now clearly teachers need to have the uh, the skills needed to actually teach their students about climate change and it was interesting that um, just last year the Teach the Future uh, campaign did a survey that found that 75% of teachers in secondary school found that they didn't have the knowledge required to teach their students adequately about climate change. So we need to tackle that through teaching standards and through the initial uh, teaching training content framework. And of course it must become an issue for regulators such as Ofsted when they look at um, the quality of education in schools and, and the curriculum. But clearly STEM skills are going to be really important as well. And it's worth saying that when it comes to STEM skills, many of which are absolutely essential in, in many low carbon uh, occupations, we don't just have a skills gap problem, we also have a diversity problem, both in terms of gender diversity and uh, ethnic diversity, and we really need to, to tackle that when growing the uptake for, for STEM skills. And this is something that we uh, would like higher and further education institutions to really bear in mind when developing skill skills action plans. And of course, I think Embedding climate and environmental issues across the curriculum should also be about career promotion. Um, one of the issues that has come up quite a lot on the Green Jobs Task Force, which is a task force led by the Department of Business and the Department of Education on which uh, Aldersgate Group sits, is that many young people, whether they're at secondary school or even at university, uh, have quite a negative view of some of the professions that will be absolutely essential in the transition to net zero. That can include uh, professions, uh, for example, uh, in the planning sector, in the construction sector, in heavy industry, in the waste and resources sector. And what they don't always appreciate is that those sectors are actually under, undergoing a very exciting transition and will have a key role to play in uh, the net zero transition. We are going to need to have highly energy efficient buildings. We are going to need uh, to uh, um, use uh, increasing amounts of zero carbon steel, zero carbon cement and so on. So we must make those jobs more, more, more attractive. And whilst there are a lot of green career uh, materials and career advice online, there's very little happening face to face. And I think we're going to have to move towards a system where we have more systematic careers advice being brought to schools. Um, and uh, which contains a degree of face-to-face -face interaction with, with, with students, because I think that's absolutely essential when you create that initial spark of interest. Now, the second pillar from our perspective of a comprehensive uh, low carbon skill strategy should be to really focus on those workers that are already uh, on the workforce and who may need to do a degree of retraining or reskilling because the, the nature of their current job will, will change over time because of the changes being made to industrial processes and, and so on. And there I think it's really important both that uh, workers are supporting from a funding perspective so we have funds such as the National Skills Fund, uh, which could uh, be a, a good pot from which to support uh, those already on the job market who have uh, a job, who have a family to, family to look after, to give them that financial cushion and support to go and take on uh, reskilling and retraining courses. But of course, we also need to, to, to match this with the offering coming out of further education institutions. And at the moment, we don't have... Uh, um, uh, and there isn't much of an offering for short modular courses that can accommodate people who are who have busy lives, who have families to look after, but who need uh, to have access to, to flexible and modular um, retraining courses. So I think we, there, there really is something to be done there, both in terms of funding support, but also ensuring that further education institutions can really put uh, forward a, a course offering which is more tailored to the needs of people already on the job market. 
And of course, businesses have an important role to play. Um, just last week, uh, the Chartered Institute of Waste uh, uh, Management uh, published a really interesting report around the skills needs for the uh, resources and waste sector, where they made the point uh, that businesses had a critical role to play in carrying out skills audit, both in terms of looking at the reskilling needs for their existing workforce, but also looking at what they needed in terms of students coming out of education. So I think businesses really have a proactive role to play here and shouldn't uh, shy away from it. Now, the third pillar I really wanted to touch on was to really remind ourselves that skills doesn't sit in a silo and that actually the surrounding policy context is hugely important. So if we want businesses to invest in the uh, low carbon skills of their workforce, we first of all need to have a policy framework that makes these businesses want to invest in low carbon goods, low carbon services, low carbon infrastructure, which then creates the need to uh, scale up the workforce uh, accordingly. And um, if you just look at what's happened in the offshore wind sector, uh, for example, you, you, you will see that the the, uh, the European Renewables target that we had there, which required uh, most European countries to have at least 20% of their energy coming from renewable sources by 2020. Uh, the six carbon budgets, uh, the carbon budgets that we had in place in the UK, which uh, required year on year emission reductions, gave rise to a wide range of policy support mechanisms, such as the renewables obligations, contract for differences, which basically made it much easier to invest in uh, offshore wind projects. And uh, it's also helped stimulate innovation in offshore wind. It's helped cut the cost of offshore wind. But critically, it's uh, then required energy companies to invest in the skills of their workforce to make sure that they could build, uh, install, and maintain offshore wind farms. And now we have a really strong contingent of well-trained offshore wind engineers uh, and, and other workers really specialised in the maintenance of offshore wind farms. But all this came from a very supportive policy context which incentivised business investment in the first place. And that's extremely important from an education institution perspective. It takes many years to develop new master courses, new degree courses. If we are to have more courses that are tailored towards the need of a net zero emissions economy, we need to have a policy context which creates that demand for business investment and in turn creates that demand for skills. So looking forward, uh, I think it's going to be particularly important for the government to, to publish a net zero strategy which sets out on a sector by sector basis the policy, de policy decisions that we can expect will be made over the next five or six years to put each part of the economy on track for net zero emissions because that's absolutely essential to then unlock uh, the business investments decisions and the investment in skills that will follow and that we we want to see now i just thought i i'd conclude uh, on one sort of uh, final observation which is that in, in highlighting those three core uh, pillars uh, of a comprehensive low carbon skill strategy I've, I've not said much about the regional dimension to this to this whole discussion, but clearly there is a really important regional dimension here. Um, on the one hand, uh, we have a legacy of regional inequality. So I remember just, I think, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I read an um, interesting statistic which showed that between 1998 and 2018, the uh, economy of London and the South East grew by around 71%, whereas the economy of Yorkshire and Alhambra grew by about half that rate. And of course, that would have translated as well in an inequality in terms of the skills base that's available in different regions. Now, we know the net zero transition can really help create um, uh, job opportunities around the country. But in order for that to be the case in practice, we will need to not only have a national low carbon skill strategy, we will also need to take a very regional approach to make sure that we answer the needs of specific regions, especially those where the lack of economic activity over the last 10 to 20 years would have translated in a lower skills base compared to what might be available in other parts of the country. So it's really important we don't lose sight of that. On the similar topic, I think there's a, uh, the regional dimension is also really important when it comes to funding. So one of the uh, challenges for many education institutions in the UK is that the bulk of funding is directed at education institutions in the Oxford, Cambridge, London, Golden Triangle. So if you look, for example, at medical funding, around 55% of the corporate or foundation funding that goes towards medical research will go to academic institutions in that triangle. So we really need to ensure that we take a much more regionally diverse approach to funding when it comes to supporting uh, education institutions.
to train workers uh, for the uh, net zero transition. So I'll stop there, but very happy to uh, take uh, any questions during the Q&A. Thank you, Nick. That was such an interesting presentation. Really good to hear about the different levels that we'll need to address skills gaps, uh, both looking at those coming into the work workforce, as well as ensuring that those already in the workforce um, are reskilled uh, to allow for a just transition. Um, and also the importance of having a strong political framework and taking into account all the different contexts that you talked about in terms of regional differences. So thank you so much for that. Um, it, I also thought you raised one other point, which I, I'll talk about just before we go into the questions, uh, which was the need for skills audits. Um, at the IES, we really want to try and provide the best support we can to our members in the environmental sector at large. Um, but to do that, we really need a better understanding of the skills and knowledge which are being sought in the sector. Um, as well as identify the emerging skills needs in response to uh, net zero and the climate ambitions we've talked about today. Um, so we do actually currently have two surveys open. Um, the first survey is looking at uh, what skills may be needed to support a green transition. And the second focuses, focuses on the skills that graduates are expected to have when they enter the professional environmental sector. Um, I'm just going to post a link for anyone that's interested in this in the chat box. Um, but everyone else, please do enter your questions in the Q&A function, um, and we'll now get started um, on the Q&A. Um, and if all the other panellists want to turn on their cameras, uh, please do so. Great. Um, okay, I'll kick off with the first question, um, which is that most of the environmental issues we face are a consequence of our unsustainability. Therefore, social issues and skills linked to natural systems are part of the solution. How do you rate these against the technical competencies? For example, deliberative democratic processes like citizens' assemblies to tackle complex wicked problems. And Paul, I, I think I'll go over to you first, seeing as you talked about technical and non-technical. No, thank you. I, I saw that question come in. It's a, it's a very interesting one. My, my take on that is that the, the increasing internet connectedness of social and environmental issues is, is as I mentioned, one of the key things that is, is changing. And therefore, I think to try and, and, and prioritise them is, is a bit of a mistake, in my view. My take on it is essentially that a, a, a strong technical understanding of the issues is, is the starting point for these conversations. And, and the foundations to build on and then on top of that requires an understanding of the, the social impacts the the economic impacts as, as nick's been talking about and and the the, the different uh, ways in which that affects the variety of, of areas that we're talking about here so I, I i would wouldn't want to prioritize them other than to say that that a clear understanding of the technical issues that are, are facing us i think is a very strong starting point for those conversations Great, thank you, Paul. Did anyone else want to? Did Nick? Did you want to come in on that? Yeah, just to add, I think I mean it's a slightly a slight extension of of the of the point, but um, when when you uh, when we ask uh, our corporate members about the 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 skills that they need as their business models change to to you know to accommodate the, the net zero the net zero target and other environmental targets, there is definitely a degree of technical competency such as around STEM skills, but actually the vast majority of the skills they list i would describe as soft skills so it will be around project management skills around communication skills uh, something that comes up a lot is systems thinking by which i think what they really mean is, is sort of collaboration with the ability to understand how your sector interacts with another economic sector and your capability in terms of interacting with that sector and looking at how you can work with that with that other sector but those skills come up an awful lot uh, beyond just the uh, technical skills Liz, did you have any comments on this? Just really to agree with, with Paul and Nick, we think it's absolutely fundamental. And I think it's important to remember the SDGs are 17 interconnected goals. They can't really be seen in silos. And we really try to foster this development of these skills um, through a number of ways, through the curriculum, but also through cross-curricular opportunities. So just to give you an example for our RISE programme, we often uh, will find experts who set students sustainability challenges and we have interdisciplinary teams from different levels in the university who've never met before working together to project manage and solve those problems and we try and get external organisations involved to support those because it's absolutely fundamental and, and students thrive on those kind of challenges and um, it, it really makes a huge difference to their learning so I fully support 
support that and I think the more we can do the better really. Yes, I'm in complete agreement. I think the need for systems level thinking is has been one of the overriding messages from all of the work we've done so far in the run up to COP26. Um, and I think professional bodies have a unique role to play um, in that they can span many different disciplines and can help facilitate some of that multidisciplinary learning and knowledge sharing. So I think that's really important. Thank you, everyone. Um, Liz, I was, I was going to just ask you a question about, um, so some of the partnerships that have been developed with Manchester Met, what are some of the ways that, that these have been made really successful? Like what can facilitate these partnerships? Because I think one of the key messages that's come out of this, the presentations today is the need to embed these skills um, in the curriculum and the need for those to be linked with business. So what, what um, how would you say yeah. that can be? Okay, well, the approach we very much take is trying to work with organizations and ask them what we can do for them uh, rather than what they can do for us and really try and address uh, the issues that they have and work very collaboratively with, collaboratively with them. But we really try to have a pipeline in terms of, you know, our research needs to be relevant to industry and the wider community, but it also needs to feed into our learning and teaching. And we try to get students involved in live projects. So we really see it as a continuum. So in all the projects identified, there'll be students working on undergraduate or MSc projects, linking in with that PhD students, but also using it as an examples in, in, in teaching as well. So I think it's partnership is crucial and the benefit of a good partnership is when everybody benefits. So it's really important to, to have that attitude, I think. Great, thanks, Liz. Um, do you, do you mind if I just jump in there, Ethne? Of course, just, yeah. just because uh, from a recruitment perspective, um, thinking uh, that the sort of things you're talking about there, Liz, I think are absolutely crucial for people coming out of a degree. It, it's all very well knowing your stuff. It, it's, it's as we've talked about before, is how to implement those and how to how to actually use that. And the sort of partnership work you're doing there, I think, is really crucial to that at all levels. Uh, and that's particularly for the people coming into the sector. But as, as Nick was talking about as well, it, it's, it's actually not forgetting there are a lot of people who have this as an aspiration that they want to develop a career that is focused around the sustainability agenda and looking for ways of, of allowing them to understand what uh, transferable skills that they've got by working with organisations that value these things, I think is really important. So I think the work you're doing there is, is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. Um, I'll move on for a question for Nick. Uh, what one policy change should we be looking for that would enable the greatest ability to get the change that we need? Um, that's a big question. Um, I would say that the if there's one if there's one thing we're currently lacking uh, in the UK, it's a clear plan to get to net zero. We have various policy commitments here and there. So we have a nice ambition on offshore wind uh, to, to multiply by four the amount of offshore wind that we have in the water by, by 2030. We have a commitment to phase out uh, petrol and diesel vehicle sales by the end of the decade. But what we don't have is a proper detailed cross-sectoral and well-joined-up plan that explains to businesses, academic institutions and citizens what key policy decisions will be taken, not over the next 30 years, but literally just over the next five to 10 years, just to put us on a path to net zero emissions. So everyone understands what's coming up over the next five to 10 years. And I think for me, this leads to a broad observation, which is that I do think the government's got a, a, a pretty good framing now when it comes to climate change and environmental issues. I think it has some good overarching targets, some of which are, are set in law. But I'm not sure that every part of government fully understands the degree of policy detail and cross-sector collaboration that's going to be required to put us on track for net zero. So this is a very simple example. Uh, the decisions we take on transport, for example, the, 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 the extent to which we might electrify transport, are then going to have an impact on the extent to which we can electrify heat, which again will have an impact on how much renewable electricity we need, which again will have an impact on how much we need to reinforce the grid, how, ma how many connections will go offshore, what needs to happen onshore and so on. So everything is interconnected and without a clear cross-sectoral plan, uh, we're not going to get there. So my, my biggest wish is that between now and COP26, the government publishes such uh, a detailed and joined up and cross-sectoral net zero strategy. I think that's an absolute... I think it's just essential. It's a foundational policy 
action to take if our target is to be seen as a credible one. And it will, as I said during the, the presentation, this will then have a knock-on impact on skills, on demand for, for low-carbon skills, and it will clarify the landscape for, for education providers as well as business. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, that was a great answer, and I really agree. I think it's all very well making these commitments, but if there isn't a plan for action, then uh, can help. how will we move forward with that? So thank you. Um, I'll move on in a slightly different vein. Um, in a 2017 report uh, by Think Tank and Policy Exchange, uh, environmental professionals were ranked as the second least diverse profession in the UK, with only 3.1% of staff working in the sector from minority race groups. Given the lack of diversity on the panel today as an example, what is being addressed to tackle this and how are we ensuring minority voices are better represented in the profession? Um, and just before I hand over to the panel for this, I just wanted to mention a bit of work that the IES is doing in this area um, because we've really recognised this as a key problem. Um, and we've launched a diversity initiatives, which is a plan for systemic change to improve diversity in the sector, um, where we're conducting in-depth informal interviews with professionals from ethnic minorities to understand their perspectives and experiences. Um, I will post a bit about this in the chat in case anyone's interested. Um, but I don't know if I, which panel member would like to come in on this one. Uh, has this been a conversation, Nick? I'll go over to you. Yeah, um, uh, very happy to. But I, I should say that um, this very specific issue has been a, a big issue of discussion in the Green Jobs Task Force, which hopefully will come out uh, in the coming weeks. And that's the sort of uh, the Bay's Department of Education and Department of Work and Pensions Task Force, really looking at how we can maximise job creation uh, as we as we move towards a, um, a net zero emissions economy, and how do we really uh, improve. Um, uh, how we're doing on diversity, not just in the environmental sector, actually, but across the piece, across all jobs that will play a part in delivering the net zero transition is going to be a big, big, uh, a big topic there. So do watch out for, for its publication. Um, so uh, I think you do need a degree of, uh, of, uh, of it becoming a cross-government priority, actually, which is why I'm pleased that it's being covered in the Green Jobs Task Force. But then I also think that as individual employees, we all have a responsibility. So um, we, over the last couple of years, have uh, changed the way in which we advertise uh, our jobs, but we've also paid a lot more attention around where we advertise those jobs. And it's really interesting how where you place uh, job uh, applications, the, the impact this can have on the candidates that apply. And we've we've seen, we've still got a long way to go to uh, improve um, ethnic diversity to the levels that I would like to see that within within all the scale group. Uh, but we've um, done a lot better in terms of the diversity of applications we've had over the last couple of years. And that's really come from talking to lots of different groups and really taking the time to uh, not just word uh, applications in a particular way and make them as open as possible, but it's really about where you place uh, those those um, those job descriptions. So, uh, I think we all have a responsibility to 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 pay attention to that. Can I just comment that from a, a recruiter's perspective as well, Ethne? Which is a first to acknowledge the issue. It, it's very clearly an issue, and, and I think uh, there's nobody there that, that's sort of shying away from that. There's a lot of complex issues uh, or reasons why that is. I think the work that Nick is doing is is, is quite forward thinking. There aren't many organisations that are being that detailed about it. But I think a lot of that is because of a lack of uh, understanding about why. Uh, people don't want to, to be lacking in diversity. There's a clear... Uh, driver to make sure there is a diverse talent pool out there as we've talked about there is a definite talent to a shortage of talent and therefore companies want to try and diversify that but there's not a lot of, of activity that's got been going on in the way that nick talked about in relation to well what do we do about it so i'm really interested ethne to see the results of, of your survey and, and and how that comes through because i think that's a very important piece of work that needs to be transmitted and and, and communicated more widely to to, to try and address that it, it's a it's a it's a systemic issue of 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 these things whenever you go to a conference in particular it's well always when it strikes me most is when i go to a conference on environment and sustainability and i look around the room and it is remarkably uh homogenistic homogenized in terms of its its, its makeup and that's disappointing but it's how to get to the bottom of that and i think the sort of things as i say that nick is doing are, are key to that yeah, I mean, if I can, I can just add, I mean, it's incredibly important for us and I'm delighted that IES are doing this piece of work 
um, because um, it's it's so important. It's something that's really important to us at Manchester Met, not just in environmental science, but across the whole of our provision. It's something that is really important and we have a number of uh, programs and interventions to really try and address this properly but because it is so important and um, you know I'd just like to thank the person who asked that question because it's really important it's kept on the agenda and we we keep working on it together. Thank you all yeah completely agreed I think it's really important to be mindful of this with, at all levels of our work so thank you. Great. Um, move on to the next question thank you all apprenticeships and technical qualifications are seen as one way of addressing skills needs and have the ability to change their delivery quicker than academic programs but technical qualifications still suffer from an image problem within the science sector and are rarely listed as entry criteria for jobs in the environmental science sector do the panelists have any recommendations about raising the profile of technical education in the sector and paul maybe i'll go to you for this question first Thank you. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think apprenticeships are going to be crucial um, in terms of the wide range of skills that are required. And, and I'm a great fan of, of making sure that that is delivered. Uh, um, as a recruiter, we're quite responsive to what clients are looking for. And, and I think the, the, the thrust of the question, which is what we can do to actually raise the profile and acknowledge the, the value of those is still a long way away. I've noticed that there are a number of, of environmental consultancies, I, um, WSP comes to mind in particular, who, who offer environmental apprenticeships. And I think that's a very strong way forward. I've been quite impressed with the work that they've done, and I'm sure there are others that I haven't seen. But I think that, that is a really crucial part of, of filling that skills gap, is to recognise and acknowledge the value of, of skills over and above a, a formal degree qualification. So I, I would suggest at the moment uh, recruiters are a bit a part of the problem in, in that it's very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to work with clients who are very clear that they need X or Y qualification to say, well, there are other ways of getting those skills. But I think it's important that we continue to do so. And the more that can be done more broadly and widely to raise the profile and recognise the value of apprenticeships, I think that, that can only go forward. Shall I add to that or Nick, do you want to go next? Okay, thank you. Very briefly then, um, yeah, Manchester Met, we, we're very successful with apprenticeships. We, um, we have a huge range of very successful apprenticeships and we find that our students do incredibly well and um, they're very highly motivated and they really progress well in their careers because, you know, obviously they're already in employment and, and it's a real launch pad to success. Um, and I think it's incredibly important that that, that is recognised. The other thing I think is on the agenda is sort of more green apprenticeships are on the agenda and, and people are looking at that at the moment and some of the skills that might be needed. And I think apprenticeships would be an excellent way to deliver that. We're also looking at how we can embed sustainability skills, not just in our normal sort of uh, undergraduate and postgraduate programmes, but also in our apprenticeship programmes as well. So I, I think apprenticeships are, are, are really um, have huge potential and, and they have a rather undeserved uh, reputation, I think, in that actually we've seen nothing but huge success from our apprenticeships programmes. Yeah, all I, all I was going to uh, add to that is, again, I agree that both, you know, technical qualifications, apprenticeship standards have a huge role to, to, to play. Uh, I, I think part of the, the challenge is, is it's, it goes back for me to this sort of skills audit question. I think it's both at the business level, but also at government level, needing to be clear what skills and competencies do we need to put different parts of the economy on, on track for net zero emissions and then what's the best way of getting those skills. And I think if by going through that exercise in quite a sort of systematic way, that will really help actually put a light on those qualifications that regardless of, of previous perceptions are the most useful to have in order to uh, to equip the workforce with the, with the right skills. But then again, I think there's a question of um, uh, uh, communication here. And I, I do think there's a, a lot of work needs to be done around engaging uh, young people around the, uh, the, the role of different professions in, help, in getting to net zero emissions and what kind of qualifications can then help you uh, uh, get to those, those, those professions. And again, uh, you know, apprenticeships uh, as well as technical qualifications will, will come across as being absolutely essential. Just 
very quickly to jump in. I think one of the issues we've got there, though, is, is that apprenticeships are so new that people haven't seen the value that that can create. And I, I think that from an employer's perspective, there's an element of, of, of uncertainty about what it actually means. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful that as we look back, if we're having these conversations in five years' time, there'll be a, 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 a tranche of, of people that have gone through that process and can demonstrate the value which will help that process. Yeah, and if I can just sort of jump in again, if that's OK. Um, uh, the report that Nick's organisation wrote was incredibly helpful, and I, I really hope that government take it on board. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to do with our Net Zero Northwest programme is work with industries, just as Nick outlined, to identify what skills might be needed, at what level, and who are the best providers to deliver those skills. Um, because um, all, all the things you've talked about, Nick, in terms of uh, demand, uh, legislation, but also knowing what skills are needed for uh, people coming into the workforce, upskilling, and who is best to deliver them, as you say, really needs to be mapped out. And that's what we're trying to do in our Northwest um, Zero, Net Zero Northwest Skills uh, sort of pipeline roadmap that we're working on. Great, thank you. Really interesting. Um, and I'd be interested to know, Chris and Ellie, um, when you were thinking about your route, did you consider technical routes um, or what was it that made you go down the degree pathway? Uh, Chris, maybe I'll go to you first. Yeah, um, I think for me, the technical side was the main reason I did environmental science was purely for like my interest in this in the broader subject. I, if I'm honest, I didn't fully know exactly what environmental science entailed or what it could go to what, you know, what I could go to at the end with the careers, but I knew it was a an option for me that could that could you know spark my interest so i think for me the main thing was interest uh, in the whole the whole thing and it wasn't specifically any skills or technical skills about that but any opportunities i've had to develop different skills that maybe the you know the formal curriculum hasn't had i think have been really valuable and i think mmu have done that so that's good thanks chris um what about you ellie so mine's a bit of a different route. I don't study anything environmental for my degree. I do languages. Um, so I don't know how much I can contribute to this, but in terms of the job we have now and the opportunities that have come with that, even you know, looking at carbon literacy and stuff like that, which is now becoming part of the curriculum, anybody can do it. I think it's been one of those things that I've slowly uh, I can't think of the word, started to like find as I've gone on in my degree. So doing one or the other doesn't necessarily mean you, like that would cancel them out because I think they slowly would start to mix in together anyway. Great, thank you, Ellie. Um, and that's a good point, definitely, thanks. Um, so there's a question here for Nick and Paul. Uh, gaining a degree in environmental studies seven years ago and as a mature student and having many life skills, finding an opening into working within the environmental sector can feel really difficult without taking a major fall in salary. Is there a gap between skills and the opportunity to gain the required experience? Do you feel there is a gap for people remaining later in life? Yes, absolutely, 100%. It's, it's a conversation I have on a very regular basis and it's a, it's a big frustration. Um, I, I, oh, I, well, the reason for it essentially is there's, there's a constant throughput of new people coming through who are keen to build careers in this market. So I, I talked before about the, the skills gaps that are there and, and quite significant. It tends to be once you've got that two, three, four, five years experience, getting onto the ladder is incredibly difficult. Um, frankly, it's the reason I'm sitting here as a recruiter. I did an environmental science degree and couldn't get a job in the environmental space. So I ended up recruiting and, and found a niche that, that suited me, but I, I know that challenge all too well. There isn't, there aren't any quick and easy solutions to it. I, I think that for me, it's around recognizing the transferable skills that, that one has. It's about identifying the types of organization that are going to be able to use those skills and being very proactive with your approach to, to going out and, and creating that first opportunity. Uh, and a phrase that I will usually use in these situations is that persistence and patience pays off in the end it might not feel like it in in the midst of of that search but there are some fantastic opportunities 
I think there's a particular challenge for the, 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 the person that asked the question, which is that having gone down a slightly different route, you get used to a certain level of remuneration and that can make that challenge even greater because you're competing against people who are comfortable taking lower salaries. So I, I don't for a minute diminish the, the challenges there, but I, I certainly believe there are opportunities there. It's about understanding where your skills, again, we, we've talked about skills audits, maybe doing a, a skills audit on yourself and say, okay, what skills do I actually have and where can I use those in what type of organizations are those going to add value? Yeah, and I do. I mean, I guess just to to add to that, I think um, it's definitely the case that if you're so, so sometimes you know, in an organisation like ours, we will recruit either at the manager level, so you know we're a small team of, of, of eight people, so we'll either uh, recruit to a manager level for people who will be responsible, uh, say policy program or public affairs program, or we'll recruit at the officer level, which will tend to be the people who will tend to put pen to paper on particular projects, um, a you know, range of sort of uh, environmental policy projects. And it's true that um, the competition at the officer level is really fierce. Uh, I'm often astounded by the amount of job applications we, we, we receive there with people with really strong qualifications. I think the issue there is uh, that the economy is not quite yet caught up with where the population and the citizens are at, especially the younger part of the population. I think this issue will sort itself out, however, over time. Uh, in that, you know, if we're serious about any of the targets we've implemented, the whole economy is going to have to be a net zero emissions economy, and that will translate on the job market. Uh, but clearly, that's all well and good if you're currently applying for a job and, and can't get one in, a, in this sector. So I think one of the suggestions I would have and which uh, has really helped candidates uh, stand out uh, when we've reviewed uh, applications is is to try and mix um, uh, academic qualifications with a bit of practical experience, even if it's just six weeks with an NGO here and there. As it just that that, that sort of uh, it really it, this really comes out during an interview process when someone's done a, a bit of practical uh, practical work alongside their excellent academic qualification. So so that's one point I, I sort of uh, I wanted to raise, but. Um, now, I do think that ultimately things will change once the policy landscape is clearer and that translates into business investment and, and much greater demand for those skills. But unfortunately, uh, the transition is taking, uh, you know, a transition always takes a bit of time at the start. Thanks, both. Um, moving on. Um, I, just, from sorry, I just had a quick suggestion there, which is, which is not to be too narrow with what you define as a green job as well. And I think that's, that I was alluding to it in my part of the presentation, that you can make a really significant difference in a role that doesn't appear on the, on the face of it to be uh, an environmental role. I, again, I take my, so my own situation as an environmental graduate 30 years ago. I would suggest that I've had a significant impact by placing the right people into the right jobs in a way that I wouldn't have imagined 30 years ago when I was looking for to be an environmental consultant. So uh, how I think about things in a broader context than, than a, a narrow technical role, and you, you can still make a difference. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, as we were saying earlier, I think environmental professionals are going to be integrated within all sectors of, of the economy uh, and of society in order to push forward these ambitions. So I think the, the definition of a green job uh, will massively expand. Good point. Thank you. Um, so one thing you mentioned, Paul, was the, uh, the lack of technical skills at the moment uh, in your presentation. Um, and from a university perspective, um, we've got an attendee who said that they've tried to offer a range of exciting courses to increase the pool of environmental professionals, but these have not attracted undergraduate students. Titles like environmental sciences, planning or the inclusion of the word sustainability don't seem to attract large numbers. How can we get more 18 year olds interested? And maybe Chris, I'll go to you first on this. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting idea because for me it was pretty obvious. You know, that was where my passion was, that's where my skills were at the time. But I think to bring more people in, you know, echo what uh, Nick and Paul have have talked about in this and the changing economy and and how there's going to be so many more opportunities. Uh, for people who maybe if they don't even know their role yet, you know, I, I remember some stats that were saying like most of your jobs that you might be going to in the environmental sector haven't even been invented yet. It, it, things like that really grab people's attention and, and inspire them to, to start studying that area, because even if they if they have confidence that 
there be something at the end of it, even if they're not quite sure what at the moment, I think that would bring a lot of confidence. Um, another one is, you know, the title environmental scientist or, you know, environmental manager. People don't always know what that is. It's still a relatively new emerging thing, or at least it was to me when I was applying. Um, so be clear what it involves, uh, what issues are taught, what issues are raised, what issues could you contribute towards as a graduate um, at the end. Um, and if possible, you know, include different avenues within within the course. So, you know, we have consultancy, the field and lab lab areas. We have the like environmental managers, you know, in, in businesses. So if you can, you know, make that clear that you, you have that um, flexibility for people. So even you know, if they have an interest in one smaller part of maybe the whole environmental science space or whatever, you know, degree you're, you're trying to put on, I think if they know there's flexibility, um, that will gain their interest. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Really good points. Um, did any other panellists want to come in on this? I was only going to make a very quick point. I, I've got a son who's who's doing A-levels and is deciding on degrees at the moment. So I've got a sort of perspective from that side. And, and to be honest with you, a lot of his decision making is around how much something gets paid. And I think we've got a long way to go. Unfortunately, that's the nature of these things. And I think we, we have to uh, raise the value of, of these professions and, and how much there is the or the, the pay that's available in order to make them more attractive to a wider selection. I suspect the majority of people, and, and I probably count myself, and it sounds like Chris in this as well, which go into it because we're interested. We're, we're not looking to make millions, and uh, but but we need to attract as wide a, a group of people as possible. And one of the ways of doing one of the ways of doing that is to actually pay a decent wage for it. And just to just just to add to Paul, you know, I mean. Um, yeah, not only are we committed to big environmental objectives, which I think will change the demand pattern, but actually the impacts of environmental issues are becoming so visible. I mean, just look at Canada last week, um, which sent a, a serious uh, alarm bell. And I think the just two weeks ago, you had the Climate Change Committee who published its climate, climate change risk assessment report telling us how well the, the UK was prepared to deal with the impacts of climate change that were already locked into. And they looked at 34 different areas and on all 34 of them were doing badly. So I think we're very quickly going to realise that we need an awful lot of people who with a strong understanding of environmental sciences to advise us on all the different actions we need to take to be better equipped to a changing climate and to do a better job of reducing exposure to a changing climate. So I really think that it's not just a question of uh, the fact that I am optimistic and that the policies will come in place to address our targets. It's also that we are going to be, th the impacts of environment and change are increasingly visible to all of us uh, in our everyday lives. And I think that will change the way in which we value those professions. Thank you all. That was really useful. And, and thank you so much for uh, sticking with the questions. We are, are going slightly over time um, because we've had so much great uh, discussion and great questions. I'm afraid we're going to have to go to the last question now. So I'm really sorry to all attendees who didn't who didn't manage to get to your question. And thank you so much for putting them all in. Um, so I'm going to end with uh, when the IES was established in the 1970s, its founders sought to position it as an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach to professional practice. And this needs appropriate skills like systems thinking and futures critical thinking. Do you think the IES has a special role in developing these skills and attributes because of this specific focus? And what is the IES's role in in helping support a, low, a comprehensive low carbon skills strategy. And I'll open this to all panelists. Well, I go first on the skills a bit because this is something that we're talking about in CHES, which is a uh, committee of heads of environmental science, which is the education uh, team of IES. And we obviously uh, do accreditation of um, environmental science and associated programmes. And this is a debate that we're currently having at the moment. Um, and the benchmark statements for environmental science, together with, with Earth uh, Systems and uh, Environmental Studies, is being updated. And we have colleagues from IES contributing to that. But one of the things that we're all really keen about is, is engaging more with sustainability in those benchmarks. And I know that the QAA um, are moving towards having the guidance for education for sustainable development referenced in all subject benchmark statements. So we're actually looking at how we can, uh, and we, we've got an early stage of this, but looking at how we can involve some of those sustainability competencies more explicitly in our accreditation 
and also provide support because we provide a lot of support for programs in terms of the resources that the IES offers and how we can broaden that agenda. So we really do support uh, that agenda in terms of skills development. So that sort of, I hope, answers the first part of the question. I don't know if Nick or Paul want to ask, answer the second one or um, or even if Adam, who's on the call, would be interested in answering the second one or I can have a go if you like. Nick, do you have any thoughts about the role of the IES or professional bodies uh, at large in, in promoting a, low, a comprehensive low carbon yeah, well, I think you have a huge role to play. A because you're you're close to the but you've got your you know your fingers close to the pulse and you know uh, you know, you've got this ability of liaising both with you know with businesses and uh, and the, and for one of for one to the better word the workforce and understanding where you know where where the skills gaps are and how how to how to address that. But also, I think professional institutes such as yourselves do have, um, because you mix with a wide range of different businesses, you understand why the importance of interdisciplinary skills and the importance of collaborating between one sector and another. Um, and, and the fact that actually many different sectors require the same skills, you know, there's a big pool of transferable skills. So there was a report from the OECD last year um, looking at the green economy globally, and that found that out of the top 10 skills that are required um, for the, the low carbon economy, seven skills are common to all the to all the economic sectors. So I think professional institutes can do a really good job at, at sort of shedding a light on those core transferable skills and making sure that um, both uh, workers and, and, and businesses really, really invest in those uh, in, in those skills. Uh, because I think that's you know, an awful lot of this is about systemic change and, and, and uh, transferable skills. So if I if I just put my point from a from a recruitment side of things, um, it's it's something that, that yes. So the, the simple answer to the question is yes. IES have a really important role to play for all the reasons that have been mentioned. I think there's also a challenge there because of the the cross discipline multi sector approach that Nick's talked about. That, that actually doing so in a co coherent way across a number of professional bodies is quite important as well. Um, as a recruiter. Uh, across a number of disciplines, you, you've got a very clear qualifications to work for in terms of chartered geologists. The sort of chartered environmentalist is significantly less clear as a as a career goal, and, and it needs to be more important and more given more value. And one of the, the potential challenges you've got there is, is to coordinate that effort, those efforts with the various professional bodies that, that deal with the environmental and sustainability space. And I think there's there's maybe a piece of work there that, that needs to go on at, a, at a, a strategic level to understand where the different professional bodies fit and sit and, and how they can interlink uh, into one another. Probably a another discussion for another time but but i think that would help from a recruitment perspective to give a a more uh a more clear sense of, of career progression within professional bodies thank you paul yeah i think that's a really good point i think collaboration with other professional bodies and organizations working in similar areas will be absolutely key to meet the challenges um, of net zero and climate ambitions um, and it will be something that we'll be looking to do. So thank you. Uh, I'd just like to extend a massive thank you to our speakers. Paul, Liz, Eleanor, Chris, and Nick. Um, thank you for providing such interesting and insightful presentations. Uh, it's really interesting to hear the different perspectives and insights that you could offer on the need to support climate and net zero ambitions through skills. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed taking part. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. And, and can I also say, if, if there were questions that, that I can help with out there, then and feel free to contact me directly. Um, Ethne will have the, the contact details, so I'm happy with that as well. Great, yes, please do direct them my way and I can pass these on. Um, and thank you thank all you to all the attendees. Thank you, Liz. Thank, thank you. you to all um, I hope you found this as in interesting as I did, and I hope to see you at the next event. Thank you very much. <laughs>